Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today, we're starting a new series called From YA to Classic Lit. So with this series, I'm going to pick out two novels. One is going to be a young adult novel, and the other one is going to be a classic novel. And I'm going to pair them together um, in such a way that I think they comment upon each other or expand our understanding each of the other novel. And or maybe they match in writing style or concept or theme or something like that. But either way, the goal is to sort of expand our reading and expand our understanding through reading these two novels together. Now this reading style is something that's called syntopical reading. Um, it's something that, again, Mortimer Adler talks about in his How to Read a Book, and I think it is a great way to not only understand our books better, but to understand the world around us better. For the month of January, I'm recommending that we read Circe by Madeline Miller and pair that with Ovid's Metamorphoses. So let's talk first about Circe. I have been intrigued by this book ever since I saw it come out. As a classicist, it's really fun to see fresh literature being um, released in this I don't know, within this framework, because obviously so many of the works that we work with or read and study are ancient, they haven't been they haven't changed in a long time. They've been set in stone, they're canon, and a lot of people have read them before. So sometimes it's hard to come up with something original to say or something insightful to say about it that someone who's smarter than you, more learned than you, hasn't already said because they um, <laughs> have already had access to this book for millennia, right? But Miller really does a beautiful job with this. Not only does she adopt the classical voice um, and imitate it really well, she also brings a fresh perspective to an ancient story, which I really loved. I think that a lot of my appreciation for what she's doing ties in with what I enjoy about mythology. Now, one of the th I had this really interesting conversation with one of my best friends a long time ago. Now, I don't know if you guys remember, this is going to show my age a little bit, when the um, Robin Hood movie came out with that actor, that Australian actor from Gladiator, you know the one I'm talking about. And I remember watching it and being so confused by the way in which they had adapted this story, but had really foisted upon an older narrative, modern conceptions of feminism and femininity, um, which were really anachronistic for the story itself. But really that's the function of mythology. Um, and it works better in oral cultures. Our culture being a literary, you know, a written culture, changes our stories and adapts our stories much more slowly. But mythology is always there to really tell us about ourselves. They're the stories that we tell about ourselves and they reveal what our values are and what our interests are. When we see those dynamic shifts in a narrative over time, that's when we know that the mindset of the culture is shifting as well. And this is absolutely true for Circe as well. And I think it's quite purposeful the way she did it in Circe. But before we get into the shifts in concepts and the shifts in tone that I think Madeline Miller is doing quite purposefully, let's talk a little bit about the form and the content of the story, and then we'll dive into the concepts. Miller pulls together all the strands of the stories about Circe. Now, Circe is the daughter of a nymph and the titan god Helios. Um, and she appears most famously in the Odyssey as sort of this side character. And in fact, she's kind of a side character in a whole bunch of different myths and stories that are told about her. And what Miller does is she draws together all of these strands and makes Circe the center character that we're paying attention to. Miller brings her to the fore to examine her humanity in the midst of the swirling themes and threads of divinity that are around her in all of the stories in her life. And in fact, this meditation on the difference between the immortals and the mortals, between the human and the divine, is really something that is center to the conversation that the um, ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans were having. Now, one of the things that Circe explores is this misogyny. Now, the classical Greeks were notoriously misogynistic, and it's reflected in much of their literature. 
and Madeline Miller reflects that attitude accurately through the male characters in Cersei's life, whether it be her father, Helios, whether it be her first lover, whether it be Hermes, whether it be Odysseus. These men come into her life, whether it be her brother, and um, reflect this attitude as well. But by giving voice to Cersei's motivations, feelings, her humanity, by making her the central character and pulling together all the strands of her story into one coherent narrative, Miller flips this misogynistic and male-dominant worldview on its head. And in fact, Miller rejects this male-dominant view of Cersei's own identity, just as Cersei is learning to in the novel as well. One thing that Miller draws out really beautifully is the way in which Cersei really struggles with her identity as she is as she faces tension between these two poles of womanhood that have been articulated in literature starting with the ancient Greeks and probably earlier um, and which is continues to be really influential not only in our current gender politics but also in literature throughout the ages. The two poles for women are the virgin or the seductress. Another way that it's articulated is are you the Virgin Mary or are you Mary Magdalene? So again, these sort of archetypal figures of womanhood are presented in this novel for Circe to sort of choose between and she struggles between that because she struggles between them uh, because she's a far more complex person than just this one dimensional aspect. And the interesting thing that I find about these two sort of poles of idealized womanhood is that they're both idealized and reviled by the men around them. The angel or the seductress. So let's talk a little bit about this concept first, a little bit. Um, so it could be the virgin or the seductress, the angel or the seductress, but either way it's um, putting women on this pole of innocence or powerful sexuality, right? If the woman is conceived to be an angel, then any mistake, any foible, any flaw, any stain upon her character is, any fall from grace is offensive. A woman idealized as such is not given the freedom to be fallible. On the other end of the spectrum is the seductress. If she falls in this category, then her sexuality is weaponized. Um, she then uses it, or is expected to use it, as a weapon to have power over men who desire her sexually. A woman idealized as this type is not given the freedom to A, express her sexuality in, in terms other than power. She's not allowed to be sometimes unsexy or uh, unattractive or, you know, get old or get fat, or she's always sort of put into these confines of beauty and objectification. Um, neither is she allowed to have other appetites. In either case, it's a very reductionistic view of women. Um, it's either reducing her only to a moral being or only to a sexual being. Circe as a character is particularly well positioned to take on this dichotomy and shatter it. Her witchery, or her pharmaca, as it exists in the Greek, um, align her with the seductress, while her empathetic and meek and um, loving character align her with the virgin, or the angel. Circe's own struggle to break free of the confines of these two archetypes is really sort of central to her growth throughout the narrative. And there are two conversations in the novel that I really want to point to as when I notice that this is uh, an inner conflict that's coming to the fore of the novel and that Circe was dealing with. This, these were the two conversations that made it clear to me as I was reading. The first one um, occurs with her sister. So um, Pacify, her sister, is also um, a pharmacai. She's also a witch. She has this um, witchery magic that she's able to um, exert. And the conversation happens when Circe goes to help her with the minotaur that she's just given birth to. Um, and Pacify basically admits that she's struggling to have the same problem as well, but she's basically given in to the expectation that she has to play this role of the seductress. She makes it clear that she believes that Circe will eventually have to give in to this as well, that it's her sort of fate to just become the evil, powerful, sexy, witchery character that everybody wants to force her into. It's really important to note that pharmaca, like sexuality, sort of goes and defies the bounds of male power as it stands. Zeus is unable to participate in this type of magic, and he's also could be a victim of it. It's something that could have power over him. And that is why witches so frequently are not only associated with women, but are associated with power dysfunction. Uh, uh, 
a shifting power um, in society. So whether that be the Salem Witch Trials, which it definitely was a power play at that time, or whether that be any kind of narrative throughout history, whether Western Europe, European or not, witchery has always been associated and correlated to female sexuality as a power play for women to have power over men. The second conversation happens with Hermes, and this is at the end of uh, the rela sexual relationship or the sort of affair that Circe is having with Hermes at this time. She sort of comes to a close with that when she realizes how she must appear to Hermes from his perspective. Um, in it, she imagines what the story is that Hermes would tell about her when he goes off as the messenger god to elsewhere in the world. Circe realizes that if Hermes wants to tell a humorous story about her, it's all too easy. That he would flip the story of the virgin on its head, so he would articulate her as the angel and then bed her, this weak-voiced, isolated goddess living alone on her island. So that's the main concept that I wanted to talk about with Circe. Let's make a transition to Ovid's Metamorphoses and talk about why I think these uh, two works really pair well together. The more obvious choice would probably be the, uh, the Odyssey, which I do think it would pair really well with the Odyssey as well. Reading both of those together would be an excellent choice, but I didn't want to go with just the obvious choice. So why Metamorphoses? I'm choosing Metamorphoses because Madeline Miller and Ovid are really doing something very, very similar in terms of form and in terms of craft. And on top of that, I think Madeline Miller's feminist approach to this narrative really makes a strong argument against the somewhat misogynistic worldview as presented by Ovid. Anyway, let's talk about the form as usual and then we'll get into the other stuff. So. Both Miller and Ovid are working from canon stories. They're working from stories that already existed. Ovid didn't really make up any new stories or myths. He's working with the mythology that his readers already knew about. Madeline Miller, on the one hand, is drawing, pulling on one thread in this whole melange of like mythology that existed for the ancient Greeks and Romans, right? And the way that these stories always worked is like one goddess touched on this and then they had a son and then that person showed up elsewhere. And so there's this twisted and intertwining and interlocking of narratives that um, grew over time as stories were told. And Madeline Miller is pulling on this one thread in the tapestry and sort of like pulling it out and sort of showing you where one thread actually leaves. Ovid is also working with this great big tangle of narratives that existed in canon of mythology for this time. And instead of choosing one person's life or one character's story, he's choosing one theme and drawing that out as the th single thread that goes throughout his entire work. And as you might exist, I guess, based on the title, it's called The Metamorphoses. So Ovid's emphasis is on the way in which people are transformed, whether that be physically because the gods came in and bam, now Arachne is actually a spider, or whether that be something internal, or maybe that may even be the metamorphoses of the gods over time. Um, but he's working with this theme in multiple ways throughout the entire work. As part of my research, I again returned to one of my anthologies. So I have the Again, Longman Anthology of World Literature, Volume A deals with ancient literature, and I use that for the research that I did for Ovid's Metamorphosis. And again, I will leave a link below um, so that you can find that uh, anthology. All of these anthologies, I think, are really useful. They have really great essays, and I, if you're like an English student in college and you have to buy them for some of your classes, hang on to them. I'm really glad that I did. So in the introduction, I wanted to pull one of the quotes from it because I think it does a really great job of explaining the form and function of the metamorphoses. Part of the artistry of the metamorphoses lies in the way it encourages us to seek meanings and connections, not just along the chain of its interlinked tales, but between the different levels of its set of tales inside tales, or between the different parts of a myth split up and scattered throughout the poem for the reader to reconstruct. Again here, this is my point. You can find a corollary with what Miller is doing. While she is reconstructing a single narrative, Ovid is working with deconstructed narratives and drawing upon a single theme. Another quote from Longman. Nothing is stable in the world of the metamorphoses. There is no unifying protagonist, no single character who makes more than a few cameo appearances, and no continuity of setting or chronology. 
So in this way, it's very much the equal opposite of what Madeline Miller has done with Circe. Another difference between the Metamorphoses and Madeline Miller is the form of poetry. So Ovid uses poetry. Um, it, in his time, he was sort of doing his artistic answer to the Aeneid. So much like the Aeneid is written in epic poetry, um, and the, by the way, Ovid was an ancient Roman, and he was writing in Latin, so too is Ovid's Metamorphoses written in Latin as this epic poem and an answer to that. So it's going to be more difficult to read, not only because it's poetry, not only because it's a translation, not only because it's ancient, so a lot of times things that are divorced from us in time um, are much more difficult to read because they represent such a different perspective than our own. Um, but I think that you'll find that it's well worth the effort, not only in the way that the two texts comment upon each other, but also because it's just so enjoyable. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this, then please give it a thumbs up and I'll be sure to continue this series throughout the year. Or if you like the videos that I create here on this channel, consider becoming a subscriber. If you're looking for other ways to support the channel, consider becoming a patron. Until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.